Uh, today we are very fortunate to have uh, Dr. Jan Velding, who is the Professor of Neurology and Neurosurgery at UMC Utrecht, also the Head of Human Neurogenetics there, one of the project initiators for Project MIND, uh, which he will be presenting today, Project MIND, the New Genetics of MND. And uh, Dr. Velding, thank you so much for joining us, and uh, the floor is yours. Okay, thank you, David. Uh, can you hear me? We can, we can hear you and we can see the presentation. Oh, great. Okay, very nice. So, okay, uh, thanks a lot for inviting me and allowing me to present Project Mind to you today. It's, it's a great honor. Um, so, uh, well, the, the title of my uh, talk uh, is correct, but my, my, my own title is a bit different. Uh, I, I don't have anything to do with neurosurgery, just neuro neurology and neurogenetics. So I'm a simple neurologist having some uh, interest in neurogenetics and bioinformatics. All right. So, um, I'll be uh, starting with this slide showing that, well, the first description of ALS is, is already over 150 years ago. Um, and why I show this slide is because it's, it's really showing that it's, it's, uh, the scientific breakthroughs have, have not been that many since then. And, and the few breakthroughs that have been made since then uh, really mostly were from the genetics. And, and so we will be talking about genetics uh, a lot today. And, of course, genetics is all about DNA. And what's DNA again? Uh, well, it's, it's the molecule in, in every cell in our body that contains the genetic information derived from, from your ancestors. Um, and it's really a, a humongous molecule with lots of information that's somehow folded in this tiny cell in, in, in every tissue in your, in your body. And it really dictates a large proportion of the differences among us, uh, like, uh, like the body uh, height or, or weight or, or color of our skin and, and susceptibility to disease, of course. That's, that's, that's where we are, are <clears throat> mainly interested in. And since DNA is so variable among us, uh, both common variation and rare genetic variation, um, and it, it really uh, is important to uh, uh, determine your fate in, in getting, getting a disease. And, and this has everything to do with the central dogma in biology, which says that the DNA molecule leads to a sister molecule called RNA, and that RNA is translated to a protein. And proteins really are the workhorses in our body. For example, hemoglobin transports oxygen to, to our tissues from our lungs. Uh, many enzymes that, that that break down glucose, so we get energy in our in our tissues and our body. So that so, so it's really important to have uh, properly functioning proteins, and this variation in DNA will lead to variation in proteins, and and there are all kinds of sorts of variations. Some variations lead to less protein, uh, or a total absence of protein, or totally dysfunctional protein, or even a different protein which gets this toxic gain of function. So you get this toxic property of an initially normal protein. So, and, and this, this effect really depends on the type of genetic variation, the exact sort of genetic variation um, that, 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 that you will be uh, carrying uh, around with you. So this movie shows you one DNA molecule. You can see this typical double helix structure, and it, it consists of two strands that are stitched together. And you can see that it can unfold like a zipper and, and, and it can fold in again. And these strands are complementary to each other. So the one dictates the other. And if you zoom in into five of the three billion uh, base pairs that are part of this molecule, you can appreciate that there are four unique uh, building blocks, A, C's, G's, and T's. And, and these really uh, are paired up always with the same other uh, base pair as this other strand is complementary. And this shows you just a random sequence. And you can imagine that if, if there's some variation in these letters, that, uh, that it could mean that there's a change in protein. And so this, this little clip shows you how this one meter long molecule, because that's the length of a DNA molecule, is folded um, and with the help of protein, proteins. And this is, this is the field of epigenetics. Dr. Rothstein already alluded to it, which is also part of Project MIND, by the way, but it's, it's not something we're going into details. And this shows you how all these, these molecules are folded into one cell. And uh, so just a recap, a busy slide, uh, DNA has 3 billion building blocks per DNA molecule. It's an, it has an enormous length of one meter and folded into the cells. And only 1% of these building blocks code for proteins. So the rest has another function, probably regulating or, or some other, other functions. And, but really most people focus on this 1% because it's so clear what, what, what it's doing. And if you would sequence one person, you get over 3 million genetic variants, both common variants that are, are happening in many people around the globe, and also very rare genetic variants that could be unique to one individual. 
every generation new genetic variants uh, arise. So some of us really have truly unique rare genetic variation. That's also where the privacy comes in. It, it's really a unique signature of every person. And so uh, only over 12,000 variants are in the protein coding part. Uh, and so even 5,000 variants will change the protein and over 50, almost 50 really lead to a complete loss of function of a protein. So we all wa walk around with having 50 of these so-called severe damaging mutation while uh, while not getting sick. So that's, that's an important concept uh, because not every rare damaging mutation will be disease causing. And that's, that's really like the challenge we face with finding disease causing mutations. Some of those mutations will be neutral, although we think it, it could be damaging because it uh, uh, gives rise to this loss of function. Um, so and why do we think that genetics is important in ALS? Well, we know that 10% of course occurs really in families and pedigrees, uh, but even in twin studies, we know that in all ALS, uh, the variance in risk really is explained uh, in, in roughly 60%, which means that it, that's a rather high number. For example, in stroke, the heritability, as it's called, is only 40% meaning that lifestyle factors are more important in, in, in stroke, uh, which we can, I think, intuitively uh, appreciate. But also in ALS, there will be an, uh, an important factor for lifestyles and environmental factors. So it's not only the DNA, as also Dr. Rothstein already alluded. And this slide shows you genetic discoveries in ALS in, in, in over 30 years. Um, and, the, and you can see this, you can appreciate this exp exponential growth of discoveries and the spheres that indicate uh, like the relative contribution or frequency in, in all ALS. For example, the largest spheres, the C9 or of 72, uh, already mentioned, uh, which occurs both in familial and sporadic ALS, interestingly enough. enough. And, and uh, the other big three, so to speak, are FAST, TARDDP, and SOD1, which was the first gene to, uh, that was discovered in 1993. You can see that it's rapidly rising. And this also shows you that this, that this ALS is not one disease, it's probably a collection of many diseases, and that's where the, the subgrouping comes in <clears throat> that Dr. Rothstein mentioned in Enter ALS. So if we take all ALS patients, for example, 100, we can pinpoint maybe in 15 or 12, we can pinpoint a causative mutation. And all the others, we don't have a clue, uh, to be honest. So there's lots to be uh, discovered. And, that, and that's really uh, uh, the start of Project Mind, where we really aim uh, to find these subgroups that are you know, like determined by the genetics or the combination of mutations, uh, which really follows the same rationale as the answer ALS uh, project. And so this, this is the birth of Project Mine, where we set an aim um, of uh, 15,000 ALS cases to be whole genome sequenced. So it's, it's a bit more than 1,000. And also uh, lots of controls, uh, but not as many, because we know that we can take in external controls. So it would be a waste of money and efforts to, to sequence that many controls. And the project really started with Bernard Muller. Uh, most of you probably know Bernard. He's an ALS patient from the Netherlands. He's an entrepreneur. He, he always sees opportunities and, and, and possibilities. And we gave him a tour a few years ago uh, in our lab. And there was this PhD student standing next to a fridge, like, like in the picture. And he was saying, okay, what are you doing with these samples? Uh, and, and the PhD student said, well, we're just collecting. And, and he said, oh, why don't you do anything with it then? Well, we need the money. And he says, okay, this is, this is, this is my, my job to get this money going and, and get a project going. Um, so you can uh, do something with these samples. And that really was the start of Project Mine. He also coined the term Mine. Mine stands for in me, like the solution lies in me. And it's a big data project, meaning there's lots of data mining going on. So it's really all credits to, to, to Bernard uh, here. And so this is where we are today with Project Mine. Uh, it started in the Netherlands and then quickly, um, well, spread, so to speak, to uh, the UK, Ireland, uh, Belgium, and also the US with John Landers at UMass and Jonathan Glass. And But now also many other countries are involved, including Canada, which we're uh, really happy about. And it's really uh, because of the fantastic work of David uh, uh, there. And also Australia, we have also some Asian data coming in now that's from China, so that's exciting uh, as well. Um, and these are the people, just a list of the investigators and the foundations that have so have been so instrumental in, in getting the funding in place to get uh, going with Project uh, Mine. And we also have uh, three new countries that are starting up. Um, and this is just to show you the growth of Project Mind. This is the website and the status of, of the project uh, as of today. Uh, so this, this goal of 22,500 uh, whole genomes, we've, we've now reached over 10,000 whole genomes already. So it's a huge project. 
uh, it's really, in a sense, it's orthogonal to the answer ALS approach, which is uh, which is massively deep on these thousand samples, which is a fantastic resource, having this multi-omics and deep phenotyping approach. Uh, in Project Mind, we're maybe a bit a bit more superficial in getting all these omics in place, and uh, but but in return we get uh, vastly larger numbers of of genetic profiles. And so this is uh, this is where we are, and um, we must be honest, it's it's sealing off a bit. I mean, we we got started with the ice bucket and all the other um, uh, huge uh, uh, financial projects that that started a few years ago uh, ago, but I will get that uh, back into a minute to that. So this shows you that it's not simply uh, doing. Uh, I mean that this project is not so simple as it may seem. Um, all data, all samples are being processed or, or passed through our lab in the Netherlands, and uh, so we homogenize and we, we take care of uh, like the sample quality and, and, and stuff. Then we send the DNA to a sequencing facility, and the data gets uh, pushed back. So that sounds easy, but this shows you. Uh, well, the stuff that, that's in between, uh, there are issues with samples, of course, uh, so DNA breakdown, uh, loss of quality, um, uh, sequencing uh, is, is um, a failed, for example, failed samples, so we need replacements, uh, and also in, in data storage, there are lots of issues that we need to uh, take into account, uh, checking for data integrity, um, and, and checking that no samples are being lost, for example, uh, that, that what comes in is the same as what comes out, etc. So this is this is an intensive uh, process, and so and and just to follow up on this this sealing off maybe of of the growth of Project Mine. I mean, I, I think we sequence now a couple of hundred per year instead of the thousands we did in the beginning. Uh, really, is for us an, an incentive to to start collaborating with all the other projects that are going on, and most notably Answer ALS. So we do have access to the Answer ALS genome, which is fantastic, and there are many other. Uh, projects ongoing, which we are trying to connect to to Project Mine uh, as well, and especially the Neuro Genome Center has been instrumental here because it it really presents itself as a hub for for many uh, U.S.-based projects, where these data are being uh, generated and stored, and and they're very uh, helpful in in, in get, getting us uh, the access to to this data, so we can co really combine uh, all these data. But we also need these controls, these extra controls. Um, so this, um, because we only sequence one third of controls uh, compared to two thirds of, of cases, and that's where uh, this very important project comes in in the U.S. It's the TopMed program. It's it's derived from the Framingham study, which is like like this natural history study, population-based study, where many 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 people of different uh, ancestries are being whole genome sequenced. Massive numbers are are projected to be sequenced. Um, it's it's also part of the All of Us program, where one million people will be sequenced in the end. But for now, we've been given access, luckily, to uh, to at least collect 10 to 20,000 of these control genomes, and that that's what we're uh, uh, well downloading right now, so to speak. And so this shows you just the actual snapshot of what we have. Illumina upload. That's that what we call that's the real Project Mind data that, that we have generated. So there's a little gap to the 10,000 because those are still uh, uh, being processed as we speak. Then we have the Neuro Genome Center, including the answer ALS genomes. There are these other countries that have contributed thus far, the top med genomes and some dbGaP, which is also uh, general controls, which you can compare the cases to. And you can see that, that there's lots of uh, compute power needed to really do something with these data. It's not just simply taking it in, but it needs to be processed and hom uh, like, like homogenized. Uh, so it's, it's uh, like interpretable together. So how big is the data, uh, are the data, I should say? Well, it's it's roughly 100 gigabytes per sample, uncompressed. So if you would have 20,000 20, samples, it's it's two petabytes of data, and two petabytes is two million gigabytes, which is enormous, of course, and that's um, uh, being compressed to 50% without uh, losing crucial information. And so where is it? Well, it's at uh, Surf Sarah, which is a supercomputer in, in, the, in Amsterdam, in the Netherlands. It's it's not so tiny. I mean, the Netherlands is a tiny country, uh, but it's in terms of supercomputing, it's 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 a, a fairly large supercomputer. It can take in lots of large data sets. For example, the PGC, which is the Psychiatric Genomics Consortium, uh, also hosts the data here at the LISA cluster at Subsara. We host our data at the GRID, which is like in the in the uh, in the middle here. I can show this here, and, um, uh, and it also allows for access for every researcher uh, in and outside the construction to do um, an analysis. So this is the actual building. Uh, it's not the whole building where the data is. It's a few floors. It's somewhere around here. 
and, and you can see these endless racks of, of computers and flashing lights uh, where these data are, are being stored. And, and I always like to show this diesel engine, the 3000 horsepower diesel engine, this kicks in if, if the power supply is uh, somehow being interrupted, so to keep going. And so it's a really secure building, you cannot enter uh, both in silico or in real life, you cannot enter this uh, that easily. So what has been accomplished thus far with Project Mine? I mean, we're not waiting to get to this goal, of course. We already have, have had a look at the data, of course. And so within, really in the beginning of the project, we already helped or, or were leading the uh, discovery of uh, five new ALS genes, which are listed here. Some of you might have heard of these. And, and also four novel genomic regions in the DNA where we still need to, to find the exact uh, genetic variants that are responsible. And there will be many more coming. And, but of course, Project Mine is larger than ALS alone because we also share the data. Um, it's all about sharing these data with other groups, studying other diseases, especially controls. For example, we share the data with the Haplotype Reference Consortium, which is this huge reference data set uh, where many other researchers can enrich their genome-wide association studies and Project Mine is part of it. But also other researchers really uh, are in need of control, so we we uh, help them with with that, and and also researchers outside of the mine consortium with ALS questions um, are given access to to this data. And it's a fair data setup, meaning it's findable, accessible. It's not it's not like locked away in a silo. It's it's really accessible data, and and I'm mostly excited about the Project Mine data browser we generated. It really unlocks. Um, the data freezes as we go along in this project. If you go, if you go to databrowser.projectmind.com, you can uh, you can see this uh, uh, data browser in action. It's um, I've got a little a movie here showing how it works. Uh, this is just showing an example with an, a gene called NEG1, but you can type in any gene uh, that you would like, and um, it's um, showing you the data. On, on this gene and the actual association to ALS as it is now in the first data freeze. You can choose different transcripts of the gene. It takes in some details from external data sets um, and it shows you how, how tolerant this gene is to mutations. It shows you how well we, we've sequenced the gene and how, 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 how it compares to other projects like NOMAD. And this is um, this showing you the actual gene diagram and how it's associated to ALS. You can see on top the mutations in patients and, and below you can see uh, the mutations in, in controls. So that's quite exciting. You can see where it's being expressed in which tissue. And you can see the list of all variants that we have discovered in cases and controls and all sorts of annotations of, of like, like additional information about these variants, uh, like how well conserved they are uh, or, or are they functional? Do they lead to a loss of function as, as I showed you in the beginning or not? And, and if you go to the results of view tab, you can see this dynamic uh, page, which will be updated with every data freeze. Uh, what's the, what are the signals in all the data? And you can download all data and all results, and not the individual level data, but all the results uh, that I showed you. To, 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 and and if, you, if you simply check that you've understood the terms of agreement, then you can download these uh, summary stats. It's not the individual level data, but really the results of the data. But still, you could use it for your own research. Biologists could use it to plan their functional studies, and other genetic consortia can use it to uh, as a replication, for example. So this is really the data freeze one data that has been uh, released. So that's that's already four and a half thousand cases and two thousand controls. And then we're really working now on these two data freezes in parallel, uh, together with John Landers at uh, UMass. We're combining the exome data and familiar LS data uh, with external controls. And data freeze three will be this, this mega whole genome sequencing analysis, including all those data sets I already showed you, especially also these controls from the top met data. And so the Project Mind Consortium is, is, is organized so in order to coordinate the, coordinate the work a bit. It's roughly 30 to 40 researchers working on these uh, topics. So there are some epigenetics going on, uh, like methylation data. Uh, of course, we're looking for genes and in, in, in burden testing, as it's called. So we're looking for new ALS genes. And, and there are some other working groups uh, uh, quite busy. And of course, this is the goal. Uh, so we want to fill in this pie and indeed find these, these subgroups of patients that, that share uh, causative mutations, sometimes even more than one, probably. So that's that's really the, the goal here. And, and really, the goal is, of course, to come up with new drugs. Uh, that's why we're doing it. I mean, we, we know that, that currently, uh, prior to the genetics um, studies, really uh, drug development has been all about screening, 
where serendipity or chance is, is more important. Uh, and of course, and, and we do trials with the wrong drugs and we have models like mouse models that, that, that appeared not to be so representative of, of how the disease worked in, in humans. So that's, um, we, we really need this new approach. It's way more targeted or semi-targeted um, to genes and pathways. And, and Dr. Rosin already mentioned SMA, uh, where this exciting new targeted therapy already is, uh, is effective. CNNORF is starting, so that's, that's quite exciting. And also having these targets, you can build your disease models, like the IPS models that Dr. Rothstein uh, noticed and mentioned. And then the screening will be way more effective than waiting for all these clinical trials with this sort of random drug that, that might or might not do anything. So these are the foundations. This is the last slide. Uh, and really, these foundations have been instrumental and pivotal in, in getting the funding in place. And you can imagine that it's a lot of money that was uh, involved here. So that's really fantastic. And, uh, and and lastly, I'd like to thank these three people. Uh, on the left, again, we have Bernard. And in the middle, we have Robert Jan Stuyt. Uh, they're all ALS patients from the Netherlands. And this is Harm van Soest. Unfortunately, he's not longer with us. But all three have been instrumental in getting Project Mind going and, and, and really determined where we are uh, today. So thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Velding. That, uh... <laughs> That's also a tour de force. Uh, I mean, I, I uh, have to say that um, so many people I've spoken with uh, in the ALS community are, are so impressed with how it has been had the foresight of bringing together different countries and um, uh, not only in the resources of, of people living with ALS in, in any given country, but also financially being able to leverage each other. Um, hopefully, that's, I think, what most people are, are hoping the world can start to do more of to uh, fix the disease. Yeah. Um, a couple quick questions. Um, one of the questions that I think uh, a lot of people might wonder, uh, especially looking from Canada, is you know our, our contribution is much smaller than some of the other countries. And I was wondering if maybe you could delineate around the cost that it is to do one of these whole genome sequences, because you know media often says, oh, you can do this and that and the other thing, but but they aren't cheap to do. <laughs> Um, yeah, exactly. Well, that, that's an excellent question. You're right. So, uh, so we we constantly. Uh, oh, we actually can't hear you right now. I think. Oh, um, can I can't hear him? Yeah. Uh, we. Uh, I think suddenly it got very quiet. Uh, better now, maybe. No. Uh, wait. Okay. Um. Strange, something. Oh, you can hear. Okay, it's just our computer. Sorry, go ahead, please. Okay, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm not muted. Okay, okay. Well, so, um, so we constantly uh, uh, balance between the cheaper genome-wide association study approach, which, which is roughly 25 to 30 US dollars or 25 euros per sample. That, that's simply taking a snapshot of your genome. Uh, but it's it's way less resolute information, but it really helped. For example, we did a GWAS in 2009, which really helped pinpoint the locus where CNORF72 was discovered later on. So it really helps, but it's it's so it's way more cheaper, uh, but but less resolute or less detailed. Uh, and and the other side, of course, is whole genome sequencing, which roughly, well, it's about a thousand to 1,200 US dollars per sample. Uh, right now, it depends a bit on, on the type of sequencing you, uh, you'd like to do and how, how deep you would like to sequence, how confident you would like to be about every variation you find. Um, so yes, that's, that's expensive. Um, but it's, it's also data that, you know, that, that has a very small half-life time. I mean, it's, 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 like it, it's very variable for many groups and also, also to, to the NS community, of course. Yeah. Thank you. Um, so I guess one of the other questions is around whole genome sequencing. I, I think one of the the cool things is that you know it's a it's a study for right now um, in terms of you know the amount of things that you can mine out of the project um, by looking at the whole genome sequences right now. But you know, given the massive size of of these of this data, um, do you anticipate that moving forward we're going to learn also better ways to be able to understand? whole genome sequences and all the three billion base pairs? Yeah, so you mean if there's some general uh, knowledge uh, um, being taken away from this? Uh, yes, I, I must say, I think uh, there are many groups now approaching us uh, outside of the ALS field with this 
very general, um, well, scientific approaches like like developing new methodologies to to handle whole genome sequencing data. For example, how to how to compress it even further uh, without losing crucial information. How to how to be uh, way more quicker in 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 aligning or mapping the data. Or, or finding like these weird genetic variations, like massive chunks that are missing or, or being duplicated or repeated. Um, yes, yeah, so there's, there's lots of methodology development that, that's really being um, uh, driven by data from Project Mind, which is exciting. Uh, and that's exactly also the purpose, that, it, that there's a more general purpose to these data than, than, than only ALS, yeah. Yeah, because it, it, it always, so I remember first time I heard about it, how surprised I was to learn that, you know, most of what we've been doing with is working with about 2% of our genetic information. Yes. And, yes. And, 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 and there's so much more in there that is going to really tell us what makes a human a human <laughs> versus exactly. yeah. simply the proteins that are expressed from the that part of the DNA. Yes. So I have what oh, there's one other quick question um, and that this one this one might be a little more interesting um, but a, a question that we frequently get or that I frequently get is all around um, exposures to yeah. uh, various uh, environmental factors or lifestyles throughout uh, prior to a diagnosis and yeah. so in your mind do you think there's a possibility that even all sporadic ALS is purely genetic or do you think, and I mean, we don't know, but what, what's, what's your thought on how much uh, genetic influence there would be on sporadic ALS? Yeah, I think, I think it's, it's a lot. So, so we know that all these uh, known familiar ALS mutations do occur in sporadic ALS, like for example, the CNRF72, but also files and TARDDP and all the other mutation. So uh, apparently there are some switch or there are switches in, 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 in the genome or on the transcriptome, whatever, that, that, that determine why, why a certain mutation causes a familial disease versus sporadic disease. And there's lots of data out there that really suggests that all of ALS is this so-called well, oligofactorial disease, meaning that there are only a few large effect triggers needed, maybe two or three mutations uh, with two or three environmental insults. Uh, and and that alone causes then then ALS and which could explain why it's sometimes sporadic because you know the full the full chain of these events are not, are not always present in every uh, family member although they do share the genetics uh, maybe um, so that's I think also a message of hope I mean it, it's not so so overly complex as as many of these these common traits like schizophrenia or hypertension where these these enormous complex networks are at play. It's, it's really these discrete large effect factors that, that are involved. And the way Project Mind deals with these uh, lifestyle environmental factors is to also collect epigenetic data on every sample. And we collect this um, epigenetic or methylation chip with every sample, like all these 10,000 samples. And, and we know from blood epigenetics that it sort of captures, can capture a past environmental exposure. For example, we can exactly um, compute uh, how much uh, someone smokes, how, ma how many pack years someone uh, someone smoked. So like the answers in a questionnaire are way less reliable. And in the methylation data, we can exactly uh, calculate or, or, the way, or the amount of alcohol used or or some other exposures you could derive from the blood epigenetics. So we really are, are excited about combining those data and, and indeed with the genetic data and, and, and maybe also come up with, with the subgrouping that, that, that Dr. Rothstein talked about. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Veldink. That was wonderful, and we really appreciate you joining us today uh, and look forward to hearing more about Project Mind in the future. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye.